Frank, welcome to the 2011 Copperfield Finance Lectures, sponsored by the Wheaton Center for Early Christian Studies. <coughs> it's a joy and a pleasure and honor to have you with us today. Uh, before I go on to introduce our speaker for the night, uh, just a note that less than 48 hours ago, we received the first book of the Center for Early Christian Studies, um, Evangelicals in the Early Church, Recovery, Reform, Renewal. It is at the bookstore. Actually, it's out at the table, so you can have it. You can buy it on the way out. Uh, this book is our first at the center, but it's also a book in which we set up a trajectory of what we're going to do and what we do with the center. This is our third year of, of operation of, in existence. And the center was founded by a generous gift by um, Dr. Frank and Dr. Julie Papathiopanis for the sure. continued up. study mm -hmm. of and work in early and Eastern Christianity. Um, it has been our pleasure to host a number of uh, world-renowned speakers, including a conference uh, last year. Next year, we're going to have a conference on church and state. Uh, it is, for those of us who don't remember it, off the top of our head, it's the 1700th anniversary of the Edict of Milan, which was neither in Milan nor an edict, but <laughs> it's still celebrated. So it's traditionally considered the beginning of what we call Christendom, or at least the movement from the margins to the center. So this, is, this book is not only a first in a series, it is also uh, a vision statement for us, evangelicals and the early church. Um, and I invite you to, to take a look at it. Today's lecture is uh, by one of our preeminent speakers and wonderful friends. I, I promised Dr. Phillips, I promised Ed, that I will speak about the horsemen and the apocalypse. If you do know who the horsemen story. are, I pity you. <laughs> uh, we, Ed and I had an opportunity, had a pleasant time to be together on a faculty at a different institution in which um, we haven't made the t-shirts yet, but we were the horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> uh, I, for myself, disclaimer, was the pale one. <laughs> <laughs> Ed was the red. <laughs> Let you read the rest of the story. But <laughs> the Papa Theophanes Lectures were established in 2009 to promote the integration of the study of early Christianity and the life of the church. Made possible, as I said, by Drs. Frank and Julie Papa Theophanes, um, the lectures invite distinguished scholars in the field of patristics and early Christianity, Christian studies to contribute to the advancement of theological and historical thought. We have had a long tradition which for us Protestants means at least twice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, Robert William Wilkin, Bob Wilkin, uh, was our first Papa Theophanes lecture. Robert, uh, Dr. Jensen, Jensen, Robin Jensen was last year, and this year we have Dr. Phillips. Dr. Phillips is Associate Professor of Worship and Liturgical Theology at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. He's interested in the, and his research and writing interest is in the practices and pastoral aspects of the historical church. How the church conducted worship, initiated Christians, and organized ministry as a way to understand the development of Christian theology and practice for the present. And one of the idioms of these lectures is not just an academic look at the, at the past, but it is the connection with, with the past through the history with the present. Dr. Phillips is editor-in-chief of the journal Liturgy and from 2001 to 2004, he served as chair of the Holy Communion Study Committee for the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. In his role as chair, he traveled extensively meeting with Methodists throughout the United States, Europe, and Africa. In 2009, Dr. Phillips was invited to participate in the Roman Catholic United Methodist Dialogue on the Eucharist sponsored by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in the United Methodist Church. He's currently working on a, a book on the development of contemporary patterns of worship in the United States. He's 
recipient of the Louisville Institute sabbatical grant for researchers in 2011, 2012. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we thank him very much for interrupting his sabbatical to be with us. For that, we should stop and applaud. But yeah. we know that <laughs> I accepted this before I knew I was going to be on sabbatical, yeah. folks. Yeah. <laughs> Reverend Phillips is an ordained elder in the Memphis Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. He is a pastor. He is a teacher. He is one on whom I blame all my views on worship. And for those of you who are in class, blame him. Um, he's the author of many books, including a wonderful co-author with uh, Paul Bradshaw and Max Johnson, uh, the Herminia Commentary on the Apostolic Tradition, um, as well as Courage to Bear Witness in Spirit and Truth, and Studiet Liturgico Diversa. Uh, would you help me welcome Dr. Phillips as he comes to present us the lecture with all the company of heaven, Eucharist and cosmic powers in early Christian worship. Thank you. I feel like I need to clarify this story about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Don't let them wander. <laughs> I, I taught at Duke for three years before uh, moving to Candler, and before that, that my, my appointment was at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, where I worked with George. The fall after I left Garrett, a friend of mine whose son-in-law had just started there called me and said, I just had the funniest thing I've got to tell you. My son-in-law went out with a current student at Garrett, and they were just sort of talking about who you needed to take and what you needed to watch out for at uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And that senior student said, well, you just need to be really careful to avoid the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Fortunately, one of them has just left and gone to Duke. <laughs> so that's how we heard this story. We didn't know we were called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And if we had known, we would have had sweatshirts made, that's for sure. But George and I were two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But I want to thank my good friend George Kalansis for inviting me here. It's a, it really is an honor to speak. Uh, I've been tempted to the sin of pride to give the Papa Theophanes lecture this year. I, I don't know if you at Wheaton realize how important this, uh, this event is, how, much, uh, how appreciated it is out there in the world of people who do early Christian studies. When I mentioned to a colleague of mine, that I was going to give the lecture this fall, he said, wow, that's a big deal. I was proud, I could say that's <laughs> the temptation. But um, it is amazing the sort of reputation just in three years that this center has already developed and you're to be congratulated on having it here. Um, and it's, I, I will be really intrigued to see the good work that will come out in the future. I'm intrigued at this, especially this next lecture series you have on um, the Constantinian world. For the last, last six years, my primary teaching responsibilities, first at Duke and now at Candler School of Theology, Emory University, has been to teach courses in Christian worship. But before that, my primary responsibility was to teach historical theology early church. That's what I taught at Garrett Evangelical. But even today, when I teach the practices of Christian worship, that's my appointment. The courses I teach are in Christian worship. Students get a lot of history, because that's what I like. That's what I know. And what I have found is that when I do the historical stuff, students really are finding it increasingly interesting, and especially my students that, that self-identify as evangelical. The evangelical students that I have really have become intrigued with the early church. So much so that I've sometimes had to start issuing disclaimers. You know, I, I, George didn't mention this, but my first book based on my dissertation was on the kiss of peace. And one of the things that I sometimes talk about is that early Christians actually kissed each other on the mouth in their worship services. And then I'll eventually start having to make disclaimers like, just because they did it in the second century, <laughs> does not mean you need to go try to start this in your local congregation. Your people do not live in the second century. It's not a good enough reason to do it. But I think that the reason that students are intrigued by the early church, and I'm probably projecting a little bit, bit of this, but I think is that 
we're drawn to a notion of a, of a time, a pristine time in the history of the church when everything was sort of simpler and people were more passionate and more engaged. And I confess, I'm attracted to that romantic notion of the early church as well. I really am. As late as 50 years ago, those of us who are interested in early liturgy, liturgists, actually attempted to paint a picture of worship in the early church that had that kind of romantic model where things were a simple line of development, where you could actually look at the practices in North Africa and the practices in Syria and maybe Rome and just sort of like draw direct lines. My teacher, my doctor father, Paul Bradshaw, with whom I've also written works, but Paul Bradshaw is fond of describing the early church this way when it comes to worship. It's like a huge connect-the-dot puzzle, except we don't have most of the dots, and none of them are numbered. And occasionally we even have a dot, and we don't even know where it shows up on the map. We just know it's a free-floating dot out there. So, you know, we don't know where to locate it. Now, early liturgists, historians of the liturgy, like to look at this really, really partial connected dot puzzle and would connect the dots and draw a picture. And any dot that didn't fit into the picture, they would just ignore or say, that's a heretical group or that's you know, some, something that just lies off the map. That's an outlier. It, it's not really part of the predominant picture. And they didn't know what to do with the dots that we couldn't place. They would just fit them in somewhere into the picture. Today, historians don't do that so much. Uh, today, we tend to connect the dots. We say, you know, maybe there's a bunch of different pictures here. Maybe the dots don't all go together in, into one picture. And we try to see a lot of different sorts of pictures of the early church. That's more of a fragmented view of history. And this book that you raised, this Hermeneia commentary on the apostolic tradition, actually is part of that tradition um, because one of the important documents that historians of the early church uh, looked at to try to reconstruct what early Christians did was this so-called apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. And so I've been part of the, of the history uh, work, historical work, that has tried to demolish that simple, connected, clear, connected dot picture of the early church. However, I still remain a kind of romantic. And I've never completely given up looking at some ways of thinking about consistency across the, the geographical regions and across the years. And what I'm going to speak about tonight really tries to do that to some degree. It's no exaggeration that the work of historians have had a tremendous effect on contemporary church history. For example, if we think about the reforms of the liturgy at Vatican II Council for the Roman Catholic Church, the first constitution that came out of the, of the uh, Vatican II Council was the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. That document would be unimaginable if it hadn't been for the work of those early 20th century historians of the liturgy that tried to paint that romantic notion of the liturgy. Following the Vatican II Council, a number of mainline Protestant churches have also become very intrigued with their own liturgies. The reforms of Protestant mainline Protestant groups, Episcopalians, United Methodists, my tribe, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans especially, all trace their lineage back to this sort of romantic picture of the early church. Now, as historians have become less certain about that picture, some of this may get call, is called into question. Because it's, it's simply the case. We know less about the early worship, less, we know less about the early church with certainty than people thought they did 50 years ago. We know more, I think. But what we can't do with confidence is say, the early church did this. Or in the third century, the church did this. What we find is that there were diverse practices of worship, sacrament, initiation, even orders. And we don't begin to see a whole lot of consistency until we get to the fourth century. 
And then you begin to see some consistent patterns emerging in the Constantinian era. So if there is something that underlies this, where you begin to see a little bit of consistency, that's curious to me. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Because I still may be a little bit of a romantic. The topic of the lecture, Eucharist and Cosmic Powers in Early Christian Worship. <clears throat> Rather than beginning with the early church, I want to start in the present and, talk, and go backwards. I want to look at a small piece of liturgy, of liturgical prayer, to uncover, if we can, a kind of historical trajectory that might help us to make sense of it. This is from a modern prayer for the Lord's Supper, which I'm going to mostly call the Eucharist. It's a small bit of, the, of a prayer, and it goes like this. So now in gratitude, we join our voices to those of the church on earth and in heaven. And everybody says together, Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. I suspect that the words in bold are familiar to many of you here. And some of you may recognize it as part of the Eucharistic, the Holy Communion services of your church. Just curious, I know my audience, how many of you would recognize this as a piece of liturgy from your church? All right, good. Some of you would not, but this is widely, widely done. Often it's referred to by its Latin name, the Sanctus, the word, Latin word for holy. These words, more or less, especially the these, first, these last three lines here appear in just about every major reform of mainline Protestant worship books in the 20th century as words that are voiced by the congregation. Does anybody know for this particular version of it with this introduction, these words are the same, the bottom part words are the same, but I'm talking about the so now in gratitude. You know where that, anybody know where that's from? A guess what kind of book it would come from? It is from, I didn't think you would, that's the reason I asked. Um, this is actually quoted from a book titled Gathering for Worship, a liturgical book for the Baptist Union of Great Britain. This is a Baptist Eucharistic prayer. That's not an oxymoron. I bring it up as the Baptist example to show how widespread this modern tradition has become of reappropriating this sort of Catholic piece of liturgy where that originates for us. I wonder whether congregations always consider what they are saying in this acclamation when we use it. But the ramifications are stunning. We don't make worship happen in our congregation. What are we doing? We're joining in with what the, the church in heaven and on earth is doing. Other versions of this are more explicit about the heavenly connection. We Methodists will say, Therefore, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we join in the hymn of an ending praise, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Presbyterians say, joining our voices with the choirs of angels in their worship book. The theme is the same. We do not create worship. We join with the hosts of heaven in giving acclamation to God as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. The hymn that we sing is the angelic song of praise that Isaiah heard in the temple when he had his vision of God in heaven. Or at least this is what it's based on. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Just as an interesting little side note here, virtually every version of this prayer we see, or this acclamation we see in ancient liturgies, doesn't just say the whole earth is full of His glory, but heaven and earth are full of your glory since it's directed directly to God. But it is based on the Isaiah passage. The angelic hosts cover their faces and their bodies before the glory of God, for even seraphs are modest in God's divine presence. That's what we join in 
when we say, therefore, we join with the company of heaven. The Revelation of John records a similar vision of heavenly praise, of course, with four six-winged creatures representing the various orders of animals and all singing before the throne of God. Day and night, it says, without ceasing, they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Another version, but obviously referencing the heavenly hymn that Isaiah heard in the temple. That's Revelation 4.8. This is a vision of perpetual worship of the hosts of heaven before God. And in the Revelation of John, the angelic beings are not the only ones that offer praise. A little later in the Revelation, it talks about those who have suffered through the great retribution, who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They also worship God day and night within His temple. When in our formal Eucharistic prayers, Christians join with the entire company of heaven, we have joined in a cosmic liturgical celebration that transcends time and space. A celebration that acknowledges and celebrates the power of God who is sovereign over the created beings of heaven and earth. At least, that's what we say we're doing. We join with the angels. Now one might wonder what angels have to do with the Lord's Supper. One might also wonder, do contemporary American Protestants typically think about angels all that much, except maybe trivially? I mean, shaped by television programs or precious moments figurines. And some hymns that we sing about, you know, I can hear the brush of angels' wings, I see glory on his face. Um, somehow I don't think that's what Isaiah had in mind when he talked about the seraphs. But anyway, you may not even know the hymn I'm or the song I'm referring to. I think some might legitimately wonder if this is simply an example of historical irrelevance. With historians in the 20th century pulling a bit of liturgy out of the museum of our Catholic past to satisfy their their historical itch, you know, because we're intrigued with the past, and putting something in that just doesn't really relate. Certainly a good many Protestants today do not use this acclamation in their celebrations of the Lord's Supper. The Sanctus, however, has been a part of the Catholic Mass for as far back as we have any records of the Mass. Always we have the Sanctus with an introduction that makes the point that Christians, that the congregation joins with the holy angels. Here is an early medieval example. This occurs at the end of the Eucharistic prayer that's called the preface. It's a little bit variable, so you have different versions, but this is an early version. Angels praise your majesty, dominions adore, powers fear, the heavens and the heavenly hosts and the blessed seraphim join together in exultant celebration. We pray you bid our voices also be admitted to theirs, beseeching you, confessing and saying, holy, holy, holy. Note that more than the angels are referenced here. The list includes a lot of heavenly hosts, including dominions and powers, about which more I, about, I will say more in a moment. We can trace back this use of the Sanctus all the way back to the 4th century, and from that time until the Protestant Reformation, virtually every example we find of a historical liturgy of the Eucharist has some version of the Sanctus with the Holy, 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 and some sort of pre-Sanctus statement that says, we join with the hosts of heaven. Why did the early church make this connection to the angelic liturgy. There are various theories about this origin of the Sanctus and Eucharistic prayers, but there's no real evidence that it predates the fourth century. We do not find examples, clear examples, of this happening before the fourth century. But let's look at a couple of fourth century examples. Here's one from uh, Serapion of Thmuis, and I refer to him a lot because I just love to say the name Thmuis. <laughs> it's in Egypt. This is the earliest written out uh, Eucharistic prayer we have that contains the Sanctus. And it's about the mid fourth century. For you are far above every principality and power, in virtue and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Beside you stand thousands of thousands, and myriad and myriads of angels, and archangels, and thrones, and dominions, and principalities, and powers. Beside you stand the two most honorable seraphim with six wings, etc., etc. 
Holy, 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 Lord of Sabaoth, Hebrew word, heaven and earth are full of your glory. This prayer asserts the rule of God over the powers, as in the later witnesses, you know, that heaven and earth are full of your glory. Everybody's in heaven is praising God in, in, for that. And Serapion includes an even more fulsome list of the hosts of heaven. Along with angels and archangels, we have thrones and dominions and powers and principalities. These stand beside God along with the two seraphim. Here's another example. This one from the later, later in the 4th century, the apostolic constitutions. You are worshipped by unnumbered armies of angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, virtues, eternal armies. And then you have this time cherubim in there, seraphim, two wings with their feet, they cover, never resting, holy, holy, holy. The wording differs a little from Serapion. Both are in Greek originally, but the fundamental concept is the same. The principalities and powers worship God along with angels and archangels, and by implication, join in their angelic hymn. Virtually all of the early Eucharistic pr prayers have a pre-Sanctus unit sort of like this, along with the Sanctus, and I can think of really only one clear example after the 4th century that doesn't include it. And that's one that's from the Testamentum Domini, which is based on the apostolic tradition, which is, there's a reason why it might not include it. What about earlier prayers? Well, here's the problem. We really don't have many examples of early prayers before the 4th century. And none of them in the we have have the Sanctus. This is one of the biggest problems in historical development. Why is it we don't have this prayer until the 4th century, and then all of a sudden we get it, and it shows up everywhere? And I can't completely solve that problem, but I'm going to suggest a reason why it gets attracted in this particular way. I don't have time to talk, and I know it's not part of this lecture. There's a whole wealth of literature uh, looking for, for uh, reasons why the Sanctus, which in Jewish liturgy eventually will be part of morning prayer every day, but not at all connected with their meal tradition, why this would be a part of the ritual meal. That's one of the biggest problems, still not completely solved. But here's my thesis for the rest of what I'm going to say. For many Christians in the third century, in century, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist, within the Christian community was already thought to be the alignment of power and the submission of earth and heaven before the Lord of creation. If we are to find a source for the use of the Sanctus, we have to look at the way the early Christians understood the powers and principalities. I was first introduced to the importance of the powers and principalities in theology through my teacher, John Howard Yoder, most especially in his book, The Politics of Jesus. Um, the New Testament theology of the powers has not been particularly well developed by biblical scholars, and I think some people think it's kind of fringe stuff, but I find it compelling. Um, I want to talk about my friend uh, Gene Davenport, who has a wonderful summary of biblical theology of the powers in his little book entitled that, Principalities and Powers. Davenport describes the powers as God's creatures that are transcendent beings, not subject to time and space, embodied in our world as systems, ideologies, governments, and people that are good by virtue of creation, but, but fallen and corrupt, that is, driven towards self-preservation, yet still beneficial to the world insofar as they fulfill their created purpose to serve God by ordering the world for the flourishing of God's creation. The powers are part of the transcendent realm of God, but they, like angels, are also part of God's creation. Point three here on the list is especially important. For, as for, Paul, for, for example, Paul in his letters will speak, um, will speak of power, thrones, dominions. I think we today tend to think of governments or ideologies. But I'm convinced by peop people like Davenport that we're really talking about pretty much the same thing. Whatever else the powers are, the, how the world organizes itself, we might think of such powers as the default modes of cultural interaction, 
but they are always the something else that is part of human community. On a trivial level, we could think of it, you know, an example would be team spirit. That aspect of an athletic team that makes it gel, enables it to pull together to win a contest, to do more than the collective talent of its individuals might be able to accomplish, or to fail if it doesn't gel, right? On a more significant level, we might think of powers as what motivates political movements, such as in our own country, the Tea Party, or the Occupy Wall Street movement, or even the U.S. government itself, or might lead to the fall of the Berlin Wall, or in more sinister form, cause gridlock in Washington. Um, it's what entangles good people in political corruption. It's the something else that is part of systems. In a truly demonic level, it gives rise to war, systems of oppression, torture, the Holocaust, politics of starvation in Africa. Power is necessary to organize the world. It's part of God's creation. It's what we have to have it to organize, but it is fallen and therefore tends to domination and self-preservation. That is its fallen side. As God intended power, its created purpose is to organize the world for human cooperation and for the flourishing of creation. And it still tends to do that even when it tends to dominate. This is the way the powers work. The powers were also the way many early Christians, maybe all really, understood both demons and pagan gods. Powers which people appease or obey that are not God. From the time of the New Testament, at least some Christians have also understood the Eucharist to be in opposition to these cosmic transcendent powers. Paul, who records the earliest glimpse of the Christian practice of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians, provides clues to the cosmic significance of the meal. Therefore, my friends, flee from the worship of idols. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a koinonia? Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar? What do I imply then? That the food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I, I imply what, that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. According to Paul, the Lord's Supper is a fellowship meal, yes, but a fellowship meal with cosmic power ramifications. In the Supper, we have fellowship with Christ, koinonia with Christ, that parallels pagan sacrifices by which one becomes a partner with the demons. Spiritual powers that are counter to God. And the contrast is absolute. One cannot have fellowship with both demons and the Lord's body. Yet even the avoidance of pagan sacrifice per se does not guarantee a fruitful participation in the Lord's Supper. In chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul denounces the wealthier Christians in Corinth who are free to come and go at fellowship meals. And so they'll come, you know, the rich will come early and eat the food before the working class and poor people show up. When you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper, he says. He doesn't deny it has power. He says, it's just not why you're coming. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and one becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and get drunk in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? The Corinthians have failed to manifest the body of Christ in their structural life because they dishonor the most vulnerable in the community. Or at least that's the evidence. Paul reminds them that the Lord's Supper is eschatological, anticipating the final revelation of Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Now we Protestants have really been guilty over the centuries of stopping before that, until He comes. But that's the eschatological part. Proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The Lord's Supper must not, and Paul suggests, cannot be a community ritual that reiterates the divisions of culture. 
It cannot reiterate the powers that shape the world according to rank of wealth. Rather, it's an eschatological enactment of the body of, of the church's body of Christ. The Lord's Supper fundamentally entails discernment of the radical countercultural structure of the body of Christ and the judgment this brings upon the world. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. In short, the Corinthians may not have understood what they were doing, but that does not change what the Lord's Supper must do to them. Discipline them into a corporate body that is different from the power structures of the world. This is going to be really quick, 2nd and 3rd centuries. Roughly 50 years after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Bishop Ignatius of Antioch describes a worship gathering as a confrontation of the powers of Satan. This is from a little snippet from one of his letters, Ephesians. Be eager then to meet more often for thanksgiving and glory to God. For when you come together often, the powers of Satan are broken, and his destructiveness is shattered by the concord of your faith. Nothing is better than peace, by which all fear of heavenly and earthly beings is destroyed. Bishop Ignatius, who wrote his letters while being transported under armed guard to Rome for trial, and according to tradition, martyrdom, describes peace within the Christian community as a sort of war against war. By peace, war is destroyed. Satan's power is broken by the concord, the, the harmonia, harmon, uh, harmon, no, no, yeah, I can't say it tonight, of the community at worship, which is a meeting for giving thanks, literally a Eucharistia, a term Ignatius explicitly uses for the ritual meal in his letter to the Philadelphians. He also connects it to the glory of God, an interesting connection. This association of Eucharist with doxa, with glory, at the Lord's Supper, however, did not originate with Ignatius. The first example we have which describes a Christian Eucharist, or says that it's a Eucharist, is from the Didache. And the prayer that follows the actual partaking of the ritual um, is interesting for a variety of reasons. Uh, there, there's a prayer before the Eucharistic meal, and then there's a prayer after the Eucharistic meal. Or actually, there's a prayer before the cup ritual and prayer before the bread ritual, and then something that seems to take place after a meal has been eaten. And this is that second uh, prayer after the meal. Um, it has three sections to it. Here's the first section. We thank you, Holy Father, for your holy name, which you did cause the tabernacle in our hearts, and for the knowledge and faith and immortality which you have made known to us through Jesus Christ, your servant or child. To you be glory forever. That's the first paragraph. The third paragraph says this. Remember, Lord, your church to deliver it from all evil and to make it perfect in your love and gather it from the four winds, sanctified for your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and glory forever. It echoes the longer ending of the Lord's Prayer. This expanding conclusion recognizes God's power and, as I said, mirrors the concluding formula for the Lord's Prayer which is also found in the Didache. The middle paragraph says this, You, Master Almighty, created all things for your namesake, and so forth. At the end, before all things, we thank you because you are powerful. To you be glory forever. Since Louis Finkelstein's work on this prayer in the early 20th century, many scholars have considered this prayer in the Didache to be a Christianized version of of the Jewish Birkat Hamatzon, the standard Jewish blessing after a meal. Unfortunately, we do not have any examples of the Birkat Hamatzon until a very, very late state, centuries after this prayer was written. And so it's difficult to make comparisons with it. We were speaking about this after uh, earlier this afternoon with a group of students. Uh, there are problems with taking the Didache, which some Jewish and Christian scholars have done, taking out the Christian parts and saying, ah, here's a Jewish birkat on Matzan, and then saying, look, if you add the Christian parts back in, it becomes a Christianized version of this. It's just circular reasoning, see. We do have later examples, however, and in the later examples, what you don't have is the power language. It's just simply not there. So we can't claim that it wasn't there in the first and second century, but what we can say is it clearly is present in the Christian version of this, which I, I am still convinced that the Didache prayer has some resonance with probably what was being said 
at the Birkat Hamatzan. So power, glory, all of this is part of this prayer and recognizing it. Around the year 160, the apologist Justin Martyr, writing, whoop, writing from Rome, makes an explicit connection to the Eucharist and the, as the overthrowing of the destructive powers. In the dialogue with Trifo, a Jew, Justin lists several Old Testament types or figures for Christ uh, before arriving at this description of the Eucharist in the Eucharistic prayer. And, he's, and this is on, as you'll see, not the Last Supper tradition. The offering of fine flowers, sir, as I said, which was prescribed to be presented on behalf of those purified from leprosy, was a type of the bread of the Eucharist and the celebration of which our Lord Jesus prescribed in remembrance of the suffering which he endured on behalf of those who are purified in soul from all iniquity, in order that we may at the same time thank God for having created the world above all things therein for the sake of God, for delivering us from the evil in which we were, and for utterly overthrowing principalities and powers by him who suffered according to his will. According to Justin, the Eucharist is performed as a memorial of Christ's suffering for us and at the same time a thanksgiving for creation. Salvation is the utter overthrowing of principalities and powers. Possibly an allusion to Col Colossians 2.15, he, Christ, disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in the cross. Now, there probably is a difference between what we see in Justin and what we see in Ignatius. Two examples. Uh, for example, I think in Ignatius, uh, the church actively participates in the breaking of the powers of Satan. In Justin, it seems to be a thanksgiving for having already been accomplished and so forth. But these differences aside, the association of the Eucharist with the defeat of the powers is central to these passages. The apostolic tradition about which I have written a good bit. Here we have a part of the Eucharistic prayer. It's a long prayer. I just want to, this is the first prayer we have that looks kind of like a, a contemporary Eucharistic prayer. Thanksgiving for creation. Uh, it has the words of institution in it, which early in the Didache doesn't have the words of institution. Um, it doesn't have a Sanctus, but here's what it does have at the place where the Sanctus would fit in a later prayer. Um, who, fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, stretched out his hands when he, was, when, uh, when he was suffering, that he might release from suffering those who believed in you. Who, when he was being handed over to voluntary suffering, that he might destroy death and break the bonds of the devil and tread down hell and illuminate the righteous and fix a limit. I'm not sure what that phrase means. Fix a limit. Fix a limit and manifest the resurrection. Taking bread and giving thanks, he said, this is my body which is given for you. I mean, you sort of think of it this way. He's talking about cosmic powers, destroying death, treading down hell, illuminating the righteous, all this kind of power language. And then he says, on the, on the night of which he was betrayed. You might think it's kind of a jarring transition. And some people will say this maybe is an example the first example written we have of the words of institution actually being inserted into a prayer like this. But if we take it simply as it is, what you see is that the words of institution become part of this cosmic fixing of terms, the manifesting the resurrection, the destroying day, uh, Satan, treading down hell, illuminating the righteous. To summarize my argument, I'm going to draw it to a close. From its origin through the third century, the Christian Eucharist was viewed as an acknowledgement of God's power over the world and at the same time a celebration of, of God's victory in Christ over the principalities and powers that challenge God's dominion. Following the Peace of Constantine, and the gradual end of the state persecution of the Roman Empire. And it was gradual. Right? But following this, when we see Eucharistic prayers and we begin to see more of them, they all have the Sanctus. And there's a more favorable role for the principalities and powers. It's like they've been promoted to heaven. 
It's as if the Christians now thought that the principalities and powers had been completely subdued to the will of God, God and could join with the angels in voicing the angelic praise. Power was aiding the church to prosper, and we may see this in the liturgy. But that's not a satisfactory answer for me. Because even if that were to be the case, the theme of the powers taking their place with the angelic chorus still indicates the dominion of God over all creation. The powers, after all, are meant to function like the angels in doing God's will. Putting them in the presence of the angels is meant to show them what they're supposed to be doing, which is declaring the glory of God over all creation, serving for the ordering of human culture. Be that as it may, I would say long before the Peace of Constantine, Christians were already accustomed to understanding the Eucharist as more than a meal. It was a meal with cosmic, transcendent dimensions in which God was reordering the powers that dominate the world. And this is why, in the 4th century, we begin to see the Sanctus located at exactly the place where Hippolytus' prayer has all the power language. Clearly, there's a danger in this promotion of the powers. If the powers are simply presented as already redeemed and offering praise with the seraphim, Christians may begin to think that the embodiment of these powers in the world, the emperor, his armies, or my nation, or its president, are already redeemed and worthy of full obedience as the authorities decreed by God. And Christians have all too often accepted such a false understanding of the powers. Nevertheless, I do not believe that such a false understanding of the powers is inevitable. Because Christ's subduing of the powers is simply not dependent upon human understanding of the fact. Christ's act precedes human understanding. Paul told the Corinthians that the Lord's Supper um, would not conform to their mistaken understanding of it. Rather, it was conforming them into a different sort of body, a corporation that countered the social divisions of class, ethnicity, and even gender in a fallen world, to reference Galatians 3.28. Paul warned the Corinthians to submit to the reality embodied, literally embodied, in the Eucharist. And that warning still applies today. Failure to discern this body of Christ is to remain in the condemnation of the world where bodies are dominated by sickness and death. As Paul said, for this reason, people who have not done, participated in the Lord's Supper properly, for this reason, many of you are weak and ill and some have died. I've sometimes wondered if some of my Methodist colleagues, my Methodist tribe, you know, if we can imagine how anybody might die through participating in the Lord's Supper, except maybe by boredom <laughs> and the way that it's done. Yet I believe this is only because we have not been made sufficiently aware of what is at stake in our worship. For when Christians in harmony with the church throughout all the ages say at the Eucharist, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, we are prompted to join with the holy angels in declaring the fullness and glory of God in heaven and on earth. The great hymn does not require our voices or our consent or even our understanding, for the heavenly hosts and the saints of God will sing it. Yet whenever we earnestly join our voices, give our consent, and seek to understand, we hear in this acclamation an invitation to holiness, and we also hear a judgment against all that would hinder human growth in holiness. The Eucharist, moreover, is not primarily about the holiness of individual Christians. It's a supremely political act. So, you know, the, the Protestant obsession with, you know, what's the meaning? How can I make this more meaningful for me are utterly missing the point. The most important point of worship is to make a witness to the world. And we always bring the world with us to church. The principalities and powers cling to us, to our boots, as racism, as sexism, as nationalism, as pride, as class division, the social structures of class and economic class and political domination, it, it, it clings to us. But at the Eucharistic table, the powers behold 
their defeat by the death and the resurrection of Christ. In the presence, when we are attentive, in the presence of a human community of resistance to domination, a community engaged in fellowship, breaking bread, sharing wine, repenting of sins, forgiving debts, honoring the poor, challenging the strong, empowering the weak in the name of the risen Lord. Beyond defeat, they also behold the principalities and powers, and we too, behold our created purpose, our ultimate redemption in Christ, and the structures of domination will be recreated for the flourishing of all creation. And when we, not just eschatologically, but in the fullness of time, take our place with the choir of holy angels that sing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Amen. Countercultural life we're supposed to be in. That we are supposed to be a community of faith coming together to join. We've got people who understand the ministry. We have a little bit of time for questions, hopefully, some answers too. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what we're going to do, and I would have never done this before, so give me a break. Okay. We have, these are telling me the mic. So we're going to carry that along so that if you want to speak into that so we can record that. Um, for Dr. Phillips, questions, comments, thoughts? Tell us who you are and uh, your question. There's a, as you I'm, I no doubt know, there's a rich tradition of history and debates about what we mean by the real presence of Christ. What is absolutely clear, speaking of the early church, is that whatever the Eucharist was, it wasn't ordinary food, and it was an encounter with the presence of Jesus Christ. And they just didn't evidently feel compelled to try to nail down exactly the physics of that, how that worked, or what it meant. You know, later medieval scholars will attempt to do this and will often today, I think, be misunderstood in what they meant by uh, transubstantiation, as the, as the doctrine will eventually be called. I, so just on a basic level, what I would say is absolutely we have to understand that what's taking place here is real presence of Jesus Christ. And if we can all agree on that, then we may find that our differences about uh, exactly how this would happen are really not all that important. At least that's, I mean, speaking as a United Methodist, I can say that. Some would put more emphasis on trying to nail it down more carefully. But absolutely, I think it's important to understand that this, we're talking about the actual body of Christ that's not dependent upon my understanding of it. My subjective appropriation of it is irrelevant to the fact of it. But that doesn't solve all the problems because people can participate, have a really high doctrine of the presence of Christ, and still participate in atrocious domination um, and do evil things. So it doesn't solve all the problems. We still have to really listen carefully and sincerely, as Origen would say, we have to sincerely participate in the body and blood of Christ, give our hearts to it. Well, you, yeah, I was mentioned the eschatological stuff in Paul. I mean, we have, I think we have multiple voices. And, I, and at different times, Christians will think about Christ as defeating the principalities and powers. But then you have 1 Corinthians 15 for Paul, where uh, it's yet to come. Uh, in Colossians, it seems to be more of a realized uh, 
a fact. Um, I don't know that I come down myself on a, on a position. I think you have multiple positions on this in the early church, certainly from Paul. And later Christians then will have a lot of different ways of understanding uh, the nature, what we talk about, we talk about Christ returning. Um, I don't know that I have a, in terms of my lecture tonight, I don't know that I want to get into discussion of, about millennialism and so forth. Um, I only have a part of the prayer up here. I'm going to talk about this more on Saturday in my class. Uh, it's this is also the th this particular prayer here, of which I give you just a little piece, is also the earliest prayer we have, which has something like an epiclesis in it, a prayer for the Holy Spirit, and it does ask for something to change. What it says, it's really about the community that needs to change. You know, sin. Your spirit upon this community here, um, and it very well be that some of the earliest prayers you actually—I mean, this is something that in, in the fourth century, Augustine or early fifth century, Augustine would say about the Lord's Supper. Uh, you know, behold, at the on the altar, behold your own mystery. You know, this this is the mystery, your mystery that's on the table here. So a lot of the early discussions about presence in in meal. I'm not sure I'm answering your question exactly, but a lot of this really reflected back on the, the community itself rather than on you know, some sort of notion about the presence of Jesus per se. It was about the community as the body of Christ. What I'm arguing here is that from the very beginning, maybe even with Paul, it was always more than just a meal. That it always had sort of power ramifications. I've sort of debated this with George a little bit last night. But this is different from Jewish understandings um, in, that, in several ways. Um, but it's like Jewish understandings in other ways. And one of the things that you find, at least I think I'm right about this, in, in the ancient world there was not a tradition among other religions of thanking God for evening meals. There's some discussion at sacrifices about sometimes about the powers of the gods, and you have examples of pouring libations and so forth. But what you don't have are thanksgiving prayers, as far as I know. And if you know of any, I'd be glad to know what they are. But Jews and Christians both share in something like that, that there was this you know, thanksgiving. Um, but the connection to the glory of God at feast meals, Jews have a high doctrine of the glory of God in, in later rabbinic literature, but you don't see it connected specifically to the evening, ordinary evening meal practice, except in one prayer for morning at Qumran. I think I talked about that a little bit at lunch, uh, after lunch today. Um, so that seems to be a, a distinctive sort of Christian thing, maybe even very early on, that Christians understood this as a powerful meal as opposed to merely a fellowship meal. This counters people like Frank Viola, some of you may know his work, or George Barna, in which, you know, he, he reads some of the same stuff that I do in a popular way and makes this crazy you know, assessments, but he really thinks that worship just needs to be a big sort of like Baptist fellowship group with kids, you know, and I hope I'm not stepping on any toes. Maybe I am in here, but it's like if we just, you know, kind of do our thing and all get together and all share and participate and take part in everything and, and the Lord's Supper needs to be more like a fellowship meal. I just think that's wrong. I don't think the early Christians thought of it as just an ordinary fellowship meal. They did probably celebrate it in the context of an actual meal, but they already knew it had power attached to it. <laughs> 
Let's start with the last two examples you gave. In singing, we don't know because there's really, really early stuff. We just don't have a lot to go on. When we do get examples, there are you know, many examples in which it's clear that, that by singing, we're meant to be imitating the angels in heaven. I mean, that's one of the... Um, and in the Syriac church, there's a lot of attachment to the importance of singing and including women's voices in singing. Uh, as a prophetic teaching ministry in the church. So yeah, I mean, singing had power, but uh, we don't know a lot about it. Um, preaching, that's really hard to say because we don't really have a whole lot of examples of preaching in wor- connected to worship in the early church. That there were sermons at Easter, yes. Did those have you know, Christus Victor motifs? Absolutely, yes, they did. Was this a regular experience of a community like a once a week Sunday service where they would preach? I don't really think so. You may be shocked to hear that. But I don't really see that there's a lot of evidence that this was the ordinary Christian experience until we get well into the uh, late patristic period. Um, baptism. That's a little trickier. I think when it comes to baptism, it's it's clear that they understood that, if you read Tertullian's treatise on baptism, he understood you know, Christians to be participating in a ritual that connected them to Christ, that was an overcoming of, um, of, of evil, um, but it could be forsaken. I mean, you could go back on your baptism. What you don't find in the first three centuries with the possible exception of the apostolic tradition material, which is problematic uh, about dating, uh, what you don't find is a lot of focus on the demonic exorcisms in the really early stuff. I think, this is not my theory, this is uh, really Paul Bradshaw's that I'm, I think he's basically right, is that what you find is that in the early church, the, the kind of the feet of the powers notion in the first three centuries tended to be more obvious in how people would live their lives after they were baptized. Again, you find examples to the contrary, but, but the way it was supposed to work, and everybody more, that we can read sort of agree that it was supposed to work this way if they were writing about it, is that you, know, you, you got ready to be baptized and you actually had to prepare for this by learning what you were supposed to do learning the proper habits for a person who's going to live a redeemed life, and then towards the end of that, you would get some mystagogical-type teaching. Well, not when you call it mystagogy, pre-baptismal, catechetical uh, uh, teaching on the doctrines of Christ. They really seemed to save the doctrines until after people had kind of worked on the ethics part. And we have several examples of this. And then they were baptized, and then they were, you know, kind of helped to understand more of the mysteries that they took part in. And we find that before the 4th century. We really find it in the 4th century because we have more literature. But what we don't find, but we don't find exorcisms really until you get into the Constantinian period. And I think the way it worked is like this, that if you went through this conversion process, it was sort of obvious if indeed you had confronted the principalities and powers in how you were living your life, or at least that's the way it was supposed to work. But once we get into the Constantinian period, they tend to sort of uh, see it in the form of exorcisms, uh, where we had to kind of deal with it in other kinds of ritual ways because it was not quite so clear in people's lives that they, in fact, were, were living obedient lives. And also, they, they begin to up the dramatic value of ritual, you know, you had the big buildings, you could do the pomp and circumstance in the big buildings, but also you had a lot more people coming, and it begins to be more like Willow Creek, really, in the fourth century. <laughs> um, having a big show that's going to have a lot of display. So there you find the, 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 uh, moti- more clearly the motifs of the feet of evil. <laughs>
as you, we had a little conversation about this earlier, as you know, the, the notion of sacrifice in relationship to the Eucharist is complicated by the fact that the earlier ways of thinking about the sacrifice were forbidden in Micah 1, 11, 11 passage, that um, there would be a sacrifice of praise. I mean, the, sacri- the, the language of sacrifice is extremely complex in the early church. It's not all related to the sacrificial death of Jesus. Um, I had never thought about this relation to the forgiveness of sins. So I'll have to think about that. What, what, I mean, do you have a hunch about it? I'll have to think about that. I mean, um, I'm not so sure that the Lord's Supper as the forgiveness of sin per se was a major theme in the early church. I'll have to think about that. Um, One had to deal with forgiveness of sin and some sort of reconciliation, especially a little bit later in order. Well, well Tertullian will talk about relationship of participation in the church and in the Eucharist, as, as also will Cyprian, about whether or not one should take partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and there'll be concern about what kind of sins might in fact bar one from being able to fruitfully participate in it. But to see the Eucharist itself as an act of forgiveness I'm not saying that it's not there, but I don't think that's, is, you, is that a major theme? Oh, 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 okay. What you do see is in the Didache, um, Ignatius, um, is the notion that forgiveness, not divine forgiving of my sins, where you do find it connected to baptism. Right? And so in a sense, if, if the Lord's Supper is the completion of the initiation rite, yeah, there's a connection there. Right? But where you find the forgiveness of sin coming up is not so much is God going to forgive me, but am I going to forgive you so that we can have harmony when we go to the table? So it's more on the community koinonia aspect of forgiveness rather than on my getting forgiveness from God. Um, does anybody want to argue with me? I mean, if you have other evidence you want to point out about that, I'd be glad to hear it. I'll get Jim first. Speaking of evidence, that, uh, it just occurred to me, uh, maybe you don't have a, a direct uh, answer to it, but I thought that the way that the church united the church was done by the collection of uh, the corporate or collective forms of worship. In the early church, you don't find it. Um. In some of the witnesses, you will have just a general uh, understanding that you will be regularly one confessing your sins. Tertullian talks about this. I mean, origin. I mean, there, yes, we are supposed to be confessing. We're supposed to be uh, clement. Um, but that there would be some sort of public confession of sins at every Eucharist as a regular way of, if you will, sort of checking the table before we take it, you don't get that until uh, much later. Um, so it's sort of connected to the whole practice of uh, you know, people being becoming uh, uh, God, so words are escaping me now. I'm getting tired. Uh, the people who had broken fellowship with the church and had to be penitents. The penitents. And once you have that, then there will be some discussion about uh, making sure that you actually are in fellowship with the church before you take communion. But no, th- th- you know, there was not this sort of, you had to do a confession before you went. That, that you get in later uh, Catholic tradition, and of course it's one of the things that Protestants were really major in. You know, so that the confession of sin uh, in different traditions, Presbyterians, uh, Calvinists, you know, will make sure that you have to go through a season in which you would prepare in order to have right communion with God. They really like that. You know, 
passage from 1 Corinthians about you might die if you take it unworthily. End? It's a penitence. I have one more question back here. Can I take the one more question? I mean, <laughs> but he but he doesn't say let's confess our sins before God in order to be able to do this. I mean, it was a it was a kind of a policing thing that that people who were were um, and this is what your chilling will talk about. You know, there's some, you know, all right. So there's some things that you might do that you would need to confess, but it wouldn't bar you from the Lord's Supper. And then the whole notion of canonical penance has its roots in these discussions about how much sinning can you actually do before you would need to go through some sort of ritual process of being reconciled back with God. You know, Cyprian talks about this at length in North Africa, and then from there it goes in a lot of different directions um, towards being more careful about how one actually would discern about what type of sin is it? Is it mortal sin? Is it venial sin? Uh, what would you need to do in order to be reconciled in order to be able to commune without endangering yourself? I'm not saying that there weren't bars to it or that people didn't think about it, but there would, there would be something like a communal confession of sin or... You know, with every head bowed and every eye closed, everybody think about how sinful you are in order before coming because you would think that this would have been dealt with before you actually came to the table. Um, they certainly, there's no notion that, that it would just, could be taken care of by just doing a public communal confession. I mean, it's really crazy how, how in the contemporary world we seem to have broken any real notion of penance from the praying and asking for, you know, for forgiveness of sins. So we're good at wanting us to confess sometimes and asking God for forgiveness and then declaring forgiveness to the whole congregation, but penance, that you actually might have to do something to rectify the sinful situation, we don't talk about that. At least Protestants don't, and even Catholics aren't so good about it anymore. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It was a wonderful opportunity to be together and think about things diatonically. Um, we are going to have, um, actually outside of the table, we have uh, rule forms for you if you want to be part of our listserv and our mailing list. Would you put your name and email address and if you want to receive physically invitations instead of just singularly email, would you put your address also on that? Our next event is going to be either in February or late March. We don't know yet, <laughs> therefore right, I'm not announcing what we will be doing next year. Uh, but a year from now, the Papa Bill Finance Lecture will be by Dr. Um, Warren Smith of uh, Duke Divinity School on Ambrose, Virtue, and the Care of the Poor. So it's a great book. God willing, yeah. we'll see you again next year. Thank you for coming.